mindful gathering for early intervention project is key in my work. There are two main trends to our early intervention approach. The first is identifying individuals who are currently or maybe in the future at risk of homelessness. And then we want to send off the rapid and practical support, um, which is early intervention in the form of guidance and other support to prevent problems escalating to risk of homelessness. We then want to provide a need for such as homelessness and other formal services um, wherever possible. Secondly, we want to raise awareness by educating people via a training programme around homelessness, warning, um, which includes warning cards and with factors and a practical prevention knowledge and skills. So, uh, part of the commission, um, I'm going to say we recognise that we really need to see and then up our game with conventions and we've got the convention duty but we recognised that it wasn't quite going far enough so we felt that we needed to move our work upstream um, and set a project so yes yeah, so we recognise that we've, so we've to prevent and end homelessness we need to move the work upstream and um, identify those of us that fall into homelessness really early on um, and tailoring that support to whatever individual needs to kind of stop them coming into statutory services um, we say we can't keep focusing on and bring people out of temporary accommodation or out of homelessness. We need to stop getting them in the first place. So that's kind of where the upstream story is in. Um, so, and somebody. So what's this got to do with my credential? Um, it's well known because it's our tourism approach around Britishia. A lot of emphasis on this project kind of really stopped the homeless presentation to come into the party. Um, I've got a bit of a YouTube video for you to kind of really explain the upstream approach and what this is on. I imagine a warm, sunny afternoon. Suddenly, you spot someone at the river being swept downstream and struggling to stay afloat. Without hesitation, you jump into the river and help the person to shore. As you help that person dry off, you hear another cry for help. Someone else is being swept downstream. Immediately, you jump into the water again and pull out this second person. This scenario continues all afternoon. As you pull someone safely to land, you have to jump back in and save someone else. Finally, you say, I can't go on like this, and walk upstream to see what's happening. As you walk upstream, you warn other bystanders. People are falling in the river. Please help them. Tell everyone you know. Finally, you find the problem. You notice a large hole in a bridge which is causing people to fall in. Something must be done. First, you put up a sign to warn others about the hole in the bridge. You warn anyone you see about the hole and ask them to help spread the word of caution. You even start offering classes to help people in the community learn how to swim just in case they do fall in. Finally, you realize that to truly minimize the problem, you have to repair the bridge. You work with others in the community to close the hole. Occasionally, some people still fall in, but there are far fewer people than need to be saved. Okay, so hand over to my little Denbyshire. So, on the back of the idea that came um, from Denbyshire Local Authority, we decided that we need to now get better at looking at early intervention, homelessness prevention. As I'm sure everybody in this room will know, at the moment, the system is simply desaturated. So, thanks to the pandemic that we all keep going on about, we'll probably go on about for many years to come. There were lots of great ideas, suggestions, maybe some knee-jerk reactions, but things that had to be done in that moment immediately that they didn't really have any um, learning from and the everybody of course was one of those and um, you know one of those things that we had to evoke immediately and bring everybody in on what that meant was our bnbs and temporary accommodation quickly became full to bursting point what we didn't envisage was after the pandemic what do we do then where are all these people going to go that we've now got into temporary accommodation so recognizing pretty quickly that we didn't have enough tones to you know, these people want to, you need to think if something. Because right now, we've got a bit of a melting pot with lots of people stuck in limbo. So the idea of this project is to stop people getting there in the first place, stop people getting into homelessness. And how we look at doing that is working together, 
collaboratively with six major partners. So Shelter Lead on the project with Covid Allen, War Wales, Nala, TGP and NACRO. Remember that logo? Because uh, I'm sure that'll be growing soon. I'm sure we're not just in my own Denbyshire. The plan is to grow and spread this right away through Wales so that we can start bonuses because that's the plan. So, <coughs> the way it works is, it is a multi-agency partnership. So, Denbyshire are, of course, the commissioners. So, by the HSG fund, Denbyshire are responsible for the funding that we receive each year. And right now, this is a three-year pilot project. So, we are the first in Wales that are trying this new approach. Um, and Denbyshire are committed to supporting us for three years with a view to extending that to perhaps five years when the airline of success that's going to be. So, as we've mentioned already, Shelter Lead, but working very closely in partnership with Cleary Dallin and Warm Wales. So, the reason why we went for these two partners is because Cleary Dallin, as I'm sure you'll all know, is a um, great organisation, social care provider, offering support, tennis and sustainment, all sorts of different strings to their bow and they are very much in line with what we're trying to achieve. And then of course, Warm Wales, a fantastic organisation that are really supporting our citizens right now that are really struggling with the cost of living crisis. So your energy support, rising fuel costs, Warm Wales are there to offer interventions and support to bring those down, just to help people to cope with all the challenges that are being thrown at them at the moment and um, keep the new building property where possible. So that's where the partners came from. So as we've already mentioned, it is a collaborative approach. It is multi-agency, so we all feed into the project. Although Shelter do lead, um, it is a collaborative project, so we all have a say, we all steer it together. We all contribute in our own little way, which makes um, the bigger picture for us all. So the idea is now that we have the six established partners, it doesn't just stop there because now what we need is everybody else to support us. We need all of the services and agencies to get on board with what we're doing and help us in our fight to end homelessness because right now we can't do it on our own. Even with the six of us together, we can't do it on our own. We need all the services to link it. We need everybody to contribute something because together we can end homelessness, but we can't do it on our own. So we are inviting other partners to get in touch, speak to me, speak to a team, contact Shelter, or any of the partners and see how you can get involved with referring in, supporting, if you've got citizens that you, you're already supporting, but there's another element that you think perhaps can't deal with that, send them to us. If we can't help, we'll sign post to somebody that can. So, I love this picture. So, having worked in homelessness for many years, um, starting off in youth homelessness and then moving across to Housing First, to the Housing First officer working with Intervention of Sleepers. I've kind of had experience from all angles of homelessness right through. Um, and when, when I saw this picture, it just reminded me of where we're currently at in terms of homelessness. This is our TA, or this is called IC, our TA network. We keep piling people in and it's got to a point now where the poor donkeys up in there, that's probably a lot of support officers right now, bombs prevention officers, you know, that they're just overloaded. We've got caseloads that are higher than you've ever been before, and the queue just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. The problem is, people keep getting in, but they can't get out. We can't get people out of the system, so the more the queue, the more they sell the TA, where do we put them? This is why we've got to get so much better at keeping them where they are. They've all come from somewhere. They're coming to homelessness from somewhere. Why didn't we stay where we were? That's very easy to get back. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's myself and really an intervention workers from Shelter Cymru. And what daily intervention workers do is every single referral that comes through to us, anybody that presents to us, and it can either be a professional referral in or it can be a self referral. Every single person that shows an interest in my own Denbyshire will get a call. They'll get a phone call, they'll do a full triage, which lasts about an hour, which sounds quite lengthy, really. However, it's very comprehensive, and the idea of that is with early intervention, we've got to get to people quick. We've got to find out what the issue is, 
as quickly as we can and by asking all of those questions at the front, nothing gets missed. A lot of the time, a citizen will come through to a service with any presenting need. Rarely is there only ever one presenting need. I double the so easy with this. So what, this is why we do the intense um, triage. Something to get everything out there in the open. The idea being, we resolve what we can, what we can't be signpost. But we make sure that this person does not keep going round the revolving door that we see often in homelessness. Same faces, everyone nervous them, they've been through every service, and yet here they are again, coughing up. So the idea is to break that down and make sure that doesn't keep happening. We then have the early intervention support with from Cleary Dallin. So this role sort of enhances on from the triage role. So um, the lady that we've got in post at the moment is fantastic at offering support to people who may have more complex needs, but can't really be addressed by the early intervention workers. So with this post is the post that can take slightly longer so we're not able to just quickly sign post or refer these citizens on or, or resolve the issue ourselves, such as, you know, helping to get them on the South Register or um, find the DXP fund with them or supporting them through a DIP application. These are the things that take longer than that. So this is linking them in with mental health services, getting the have the appointment, taking them to the job centre to do a benefit review. Things like that would take a little bit longer than the triage staff haven't got the time to do. We then have um, another support officer with us who is predominantly there to support the PRS network. So in homelessness services, a lot of emphasis is on the tenant or the contract holder now. Not much work done with the landlords and there's a lot of bad board towards landlords, especially as like because you're in homelessness and you have been for many years, we always blame the landlords. It's not always a long word of sign. So, goodness me, we've got some. We now are popular. Um, so, yeah, we've got a PRS support worker. So, what this um, person will do will liaise with landlords and tenants and do mediation work to try and bring resolutions about. So, if the landlord is threatened in eviction but hasn't yet carried it through, we're getting them and say, what's going on? What do you mean threatening the eviction? What's happened? Well, you know, it is not at the end of three weeks or whatever, whatever it may be. Okay, well, what can we do to rectify that? If we can sort this issue, can this person remain the property? Well, yeah, yeah, we don't really want to evict them. It's a lengthy process, it takes a while, but I need the rent. So that's what we do. We support the tenant and the landlord however necessary. We also have the added benefit of that role um, being that we have the energy and affordable fuel and you know we're supposed to support in that way through Royal Mills as well which is a fantastic service and at the moment we are utilising that service an awful lot as I'm sure you can imagine cost of living, specifically energy we get a lot of referrals through to support with that then we do have three other partners that are engagement partners and the idea of these roles is that they feed into us again with referrals. So not necessarily not necessarily a direct partner. So um, you know, they're not they're not involved with the work that we do on this front line. However, they have committed to sending referrals our way and um, advocating to the service and you know just, just linking people in with us. So we have TGP, NACRO, and now we're also on the bed. <coughs> <laughs> So, what can my home then be to help with? So because we're really intervention, and because we're clean homelessness prevention support, it's very difficult to define what it is exactly that we do. Because anything that comes through to us could potentially lead into homelessness if not dealt with. So, you know, rising utility bills might not seem like an issue that would lead somebody into homelessness. However, when you're having to make the choice between paying your utility bills or paying your rent, be like, that's that's when things start to escalate. Rising food costs, people are choosing whether they heat or eat, which we hear a lot about, which is shocking to think in this day and age, especially in a country such as ours, but you know, this is the reality of it. So as a project, we will support anything that is giving people challenges, stress, 
anything that we're thinking of and explain something else. So typical examples, housing issues, so you did repair, um, over occupancy, ASB, housing enforcement, all the things that, again, if left unresolved, can lead into homelessness. That's where your issues come with your landlord and your tenant. So we get involved and kind of mediate there if there is disrepair and the landlord's not willing to do the work. Or as we tend to find, it's not that they're not willing to do the work, it's that they themselves can't afford to do it. So we then support the landlord as well to get funding or to get whatever support they need to do the repairs. Because rarely do we ever find a landlord that just comes onto our radar that says, oh, I'm just not doing it because I don't want to do it. Not the case, they, they too can't afford to do it. So we help with things like that, just to keep the relationship where it needs to be. Finances, as we've already touched upon, that's a biggie for us. People are just struggling at, at, you know, with every aspect as a cost of living. Um, employment, training and education services, we're linking in with the likes of Work in Denbyshire, the Job Centre. We've got some great links going on there, so we're helping people to get back into work so that they're better in themselves, their outlook, supporting them with their mental health and increasing the finances. You know, all things that we can do to help make the situation better. Linking in with a lot of health and wellbeing, social care services, um, mental health, as we all know we've heard about today, it is a major player at the moment that's causing significant issues. But again, you know, the mental health services are so stretched. You know, they're doing a fantastic job over there. We speak to them daily and, you know, they are struggling as much as anybody else is. It's not their fault, but caseloads are a huge. I think we've got to get better with services to support them as well, help them to bring their caseloads down. So that's the plan, that's the idea, is it? There's an awful lot involved and, you know, like I say, it's very hard to define, you know, what's going to come through to us from one day to the next, but it's just to know that we are there. So whatever the issue may be, we will kindly support wherever we can. And if we can, we will find somebody to help. We never turn in for us away at a technical bus. So this is just a bit of an overview on who's already involved and who, uh, who we're working with at the moment, some of the organisations that are committed to referring into us and vice versa, we refer it out to them as well. And, and we hope that the next time we see you all, that I'll be completely full and, and onto the next screen as well, because the more partners we can get, the better for everybody in the mall. So, as if that wasn't enough. And <laughs> This project has also been tasked with providing training for up to 700 delegates per year on the signs of early intervention homelessness. So what we plan to do is get as many professionals, as many services, many individuals. We're looking at teachers, we're looking at hairdressers. We are looking at anybody that might come into contact with somebody <coughs> that might be struggling, which is probably everybody at the moment, isn't it? Every sort of and so in the supermarket is struggling. So the idea is raise awareness, look for those early warning signs that we may have passed off before as that will matter leading to homelessness. We just can't put the gas on. Yeah. Actually, if they can't put on this month and next month and the month after, what are they gonna do? Pay the rent or put the heating not so not so bad today. You see so if it used to, but as we get into autumn and winter, it's a real concern. And that's when ours and one way is this um caseloads absolutely goes through the roof. So we do offer this. We actually offer it free of charge for G3. So there is no cost to the delegate and we have the most wonderful shed in there. It's just the IP issue. He never has a dodgy clicker, he never has some track for talking. So don't worry, if you do sign up for training, you will absolutely not get me. No <laughs> mental. <laughs> So yeah, so if anybody's interested in attending that training, please do reach out. There's, there's two parts so far, and um, we're we'll growing that as we go, but there's two parts that we currently offer, so it's two half day sessions, and it's just, you know, we're not going to teach anybody to suck eggs, because you, know, you all know about homelessness, you all know what it involves, and you all know um, how to support people who are coming into the homelessness system. But it's just reminding us, it's just remembering, and listening to the stories of those with lived experience, those that have been through these systems, and they tell us how it is, rather than us telling them. So it's important. It's important to keep our eye on that. So, this is how you get involved. Don't worry, I don't expect you to write all that down. You can, sure. 
we will send these out. So these are our contact details. Now, just to make you aware, at the moment, we only cover the county of Denbyshire. So we are North Wales. However, that will we we are going to rent out because this service has already proven its worth. We already know how important this is. All we hear about nowadays in homelessness is prevention. And, and that's getting really far to get better at. So take the details down. If you want more information from me, you can chat to me. If you want to speak to the team, give me a ring. They'll tell you, you know, any information you need. But certainly do get in touch about that training. So. I'm going to go one minute. We'll fix that over your shirt and then you'll be ready like that. They're a truck, they're a truck. They're a truck. So what we're going to do when, when it's ready is we're just going to have a quick shot of video that we've created. Oh, I'm so good that here last time, don't we? <laughs> so this video was created by our Take, um, Take Notice project, which works with citizens that have been through the Shelter Club Service. So they are now telling us what the situation was like for them and, and what it meant to them to receive the support and help. So, um, yeah, I'll hand over to. Ready? How many? We're ready, yeah. Go. Me, out of all you. Yes, I'm out of Do this. Thank you. Back on push. I found myself homeless when I was pregnant. It was the worst feeling ever, and I never imagined that I would never not have a roof over my head. Being homeless sucks. I've heard people say, you can't become homeless if you have kids, but that's not true. I found myself homeless with my daughter when my landlord wanted the house back to live in. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have hundreds of pounds spare to move into another house. I had to go to the council for help. We were homeless for nearly two years, staying in temporary accommodation. It's not what I ever wanted for my daughter. If it can happen to us, it can happen to anyone. At the age of 17, I failed the college course and the year after I turned me going to movie and I tried college again. The course would have the stress of college and being pushed into the baby was too much for me now. It's that began the relationship breaking by errors. When the fresh I and mean, this idea became anywhere. I found myself in a situation that I thought was impossible. I was homeless, it was separate, and I needed to find a place to stay. I asked friends who were kind enough to let me stay in work for a single much time. However, there is only so long you can stay in friends' places. I was lucky I did not end up on the streets, but I was homeless. Homelessness is a very strong and powerful word. What is its meaning? Does it make you out and take drugs? Sleep in shop doorways. Look at me, what do you see? I'm out fishing, a hobby for my childhood. Yes, I may have a drink, but you would too when having some you time, yes. I'm just a normal guy. Live it a normal life. I became homeless so about six or seven years ago. The accommodation that I was living in was my partner's place at work, therefore, I had no legal tenancy rights. After 12 years, uh, my partner decided to fix to me very suddenly. 
I found myself overdose without any legal redress or at all. This was very disconcerting. I had to make very urgent decisions and eventually found some accommodation in Wales for myself and the two dogs that I had, which were a further complication in the eviction. The impact this had upon me um, um, was to make me feel very depressed. Anyone could find themselves in these circumstances. After leaving the military, I became quite all well and was eventually diagnosed in PTSD. I was able to work, I made a bit of code, nor able to manage the simple baby tasks. I very quickly got behind in my event payments. I still to resolve this with face to face meetings with my landlord. My life really did seem to fall to bits. The child wrenching, soul destroying, and leaving me with a sense of self worthlessness. Since receiving help and support, I had life how to do as well should you and my teacher was misdrighted. My landlady wanted her house back, so I had to leave. But I'm not your typical homeless person that you might think of. I was already a pensioner at that point. I had been a professional person all my work in life, and I did not choose to become homeless. The realization that I could suddenly lose everything that mattered to me was dead as easy. My suburb life got shattered also and got to be bought in drag years. At my apple and highly keen aunt, but I've got some time. It's not by up in cool little gobble. 